It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Before we get started, if you are on YouTube, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, make sure you share this video with someone who can gain some great value. If you're on the audio side, make sure you leave us a five star rating and review. Very excited about this week's episode. Here with me, I have Rod Watson. Rod, appreciate you jumping on the show, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. How are you feeling today? Great. Another another day and opportunity to do great things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let's let's jump right into it. So, sure. Rod, you've done over two hundred million in sales. Uh, take us back to the beginning. How did you get started in real estate? Yeah, well, that's a that's a great question. Um, the beginning started well over twenty years ago. Um, really, long story short, is you know I was on the couch one evening um, watching I don't remember some TV show, um, and then you know infomercial comes on once regular TV comes to an end. <laughs> And uh, there was a show, well, no, there was an infomercial um, called Calter. The, the gentleman's name was Calter and Sheets, How to Buy a Home with No Money Down. That piqued my interest in real estate, and really everything took off from there. I spent a lot of time just in, immersing myself in understanding the the terminologies of real estate, uh, memorizing them, writing the, each definition or a specific word and understanding the definition, like a mortgage, amortized rate, down payment, et cetera, like title, title insurance, title policy, mortgage premiums. I learned what all of those things mean over time. And then from there, um, you know, I just stayed engaged with reading different books. And um, around 2005, we bought our first property, my wife and I, really from learning everything from that course that opened the door for us to own our first home in Texas. And then from there, you know, I studied more different investor approach from uh, wholesaling to, um, you know, real estate syndication um, to mixed use commercial development. I read pretty much anything I could pretty, pretty much pick up and understand real estate. And then around 2008, I got my license in Texas. You know, my wife got her license first in 06. Um, she held it, held the fort down. And, you know, a couple of years later, you know, I got mine. And then from there, we were husband and wife team and we never looked back. Love it. Love it. So how long did it take you to close your first your first deal as, as an agent? Well, um, in Texas, it was quick. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't have an outlet. When I first got my license in Texas, I would say, Literally, like maybe four to three months later, I was closing my first deal. But my wife had already started closing deals. So for me, you know, I had an understanding of the process and I had relationships already in Texas. So mm -hmm. securing my first deal was really like right there in front of me. And what yeah. helped me do that is I was at a car dealership working at Lexus and Porsche. Um, both of those dealerships, I had amassed over 400 transactions and sales, helping people buy high end luxury cars. And uh, from those relationships, I had my book of transactions. So mm -hmm. I went back and this was before cell phones and yeah. email and all that stuff. I had well, email was in, but I went I went back and reached out and wrote a letter to all of those individuals, letting them know that I was in real estate. And at that time, the market had just crashed in 08. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were in jeopardy of losing their properties right to foreclosure. So I wrote a letter to every to everyone that I had sold a car to, letting them know that if they knew someone that was in jeopardy of potentially losing their home to foreclosure um, or was in a distressed situation, we may be able to assist them to help them get out of that situation or protect them from foreclosure altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, that landed me my first few deals. And also I got out and went out and knocked on doors. You know, I literally like knocked on doors to talk to people, um, to inform them that I was there to help them and to keep them from seeing their homes going to foreclosure. And that's how it all started. Definitely. It's interesting. You, you kind of got your start when the world seemed to be crashing down yeah. and a lot of people probably were running in the opposite direction yeah. of real estate. So can you talk more about like what, <laughs> what, what, what it was like um, being in the business, you and your wife at that time when people were just like panicking, quite frankly? It, you know, it was different because one, I never experienced a real estate crash. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the real estate crash prior to that happened in the late late eighties, early nineties, and I was in I was in you know junior high and high school, so I yeah. had no clue what was going on. But to be in that position where we were able to help people, um, it felt really good, and it, it gave me a lot of drive because you know when you're working in a corporate sector and you're just getting up and you're doing what you have to do, mm -hmm. unless you're passionate about that, oftentimes that can get redundant, right? And what I found is that I found a lot of fulfillment in my purpose and being able to see other people be informed about how to avoid foreclosure, how to how not to lose their homes or how to work out a loan modification with your bank. I was providing value to individuals. So 
to to be able to do that, it felt really, really good. You know, it was a, it was an amazing feeling. And then also to be able to work with my wife, you know, she was also working with traditional home home buyers and sellers and to mm-hmm. see her growth, you know, from not having a license and being, um, you know, being in the position now as a mother. We had our first two daughters at that time. And, you know, she had signed up with Keller Williams and she was going to her trainings and she would get dressed up in her suit and everything. <laughs> and she would go out the door and I would be with the girls, you know, looking back on that, it's not often that people get to have those experiences where two spouses get to work together in the mm-hmm. same career field, build together, grow together. So it was it was a great feeling. And I knew at that point when I had walked away from my job to pursue real estate full time and work with her deep in my heart and in my spirit, I knew I was doing the right thing. We were doing the right thing. Definitely. And and one of the things I like that you mentioned is like you mentioned a direct correlation your job had to what you were doing within real estate. Like yeah. Your, your first clients were those who you sold cars to. So I think that's something people should pay attention to because a lot of times people struggle to see, you know, how their nine to five can connect with what they want to do within real estate, whether it's be an agent or investor. I mean, quite maybe even the money you get from your job in addition to some skills can help you out. So I like, I like that you made that connection. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's important for people to also recognize how relationships are important, Mm -hmm. valuing relationships, valuing people. And that was something my mother taught me at a very early age because um, you know, she would just remind me the best thing you can do for people is help them, give, you know, encourage them, edify people, speak mm-hmm. words of encouragement to individuals and, and be there to support people. And I carried that throughout my, you know, young adolescent, you know, as a child and then as a young adolescent and into adulthood. And it's really helped me open a lot of doors. And, you know, I think that oftentimes we overlook the importance of valuing people. We focus so much on things, having things, getting places or having titles and status or showing people I did this or I have it. In reality, it really comes down to the relationships that mm-hmm. what, what I found is that relationships are more valuable than, than, than actual money. Yeah. currency because you can have money but then there's certain rooms you can't get into i don't care how much money you have right or there are certain situations where you may try to buy something from somebody and they don't have a relationship with you they ain't going to sell it to you mm-hmm. so um, valuing people in relationships is really important definitely definitely uh, so i definitely definitely like that you that you mentioned that so a lot of agents it takes time to close their their first deal uh, so what advice do you have to withstand that you know because especially in yeah. the competitive markets it could take some time so you know what would your advice be i know obviously it's a commission-based business too and people have like practical needs yeah um, so how would you advise somebody in that situation well, i think everybody has to evaluate their situation where they are in life and who mm-hmm. they are what their strengths are right and what do they have accessible right there in front of them and i go mm-hmm. back to relationships well, what are your relationships like? Because relationships are a form of currency. I tell people all the time there's four forms of currency, knowledge, relationships, money, and, and then, of course, your time. Mm-hmm. And how you spend your time is important. It's one of your greatest assets. So the next thing to that is relationships. It is a currency. And if your relationships aren't in good you know, in, in good status, it's, sometimes it can be hard in the beginning. It's not that you may have done bad things. It's just that if you don't know a lot of people, if you haven't really built relationships with a lot of people, this business is a relationship business. People hire you because they trust you, they like you, and they believe in you. Mm-hmm. And of course, if you have a proven track record, that is going to be another reason why they hire you. So if you don't have a track record and you don't have relationships, then you have to start focusing on building relationships with the type of people you want to work with. Also, you want to start understanding the market, Mm -hmm. where you're going to sell or where you would like to sell, where you live. All of those things are important when you're first starting out to evaluate. And then you need to do your research and development. Right. And what I mean by that is if you want to sell, let's say, in a particular neighborhood, you need to study those top agents that are selling in those neighborhoods or selling at the price points that you want to sell at. And then maybe pick their brains, take them out to coffee, you know, to lunch if they're willing to give you that time. Um, and then also steady the local markets, you know, attend caravans, um, you know, attend events, network. Right. Mm-hmm. Those are things I think that are important when you're first starting out that are going to set you up for success long term. And you have to be committed to doing those things for a long period of time. You can't be like, well, you know, I've been hustling for a year. I've been hustling for three months. I'm not seeing any results. Well, <laughs> You got to hustle harder and you got to hustle longer. Yeah. And the key is, is that if you stay consistent and persistent and you steady the market, you know, you work on perfecting your craft, you build great relationships. I think that is the true ingredient for having success in this business. Now, the timing of it, how long that would take is different for everyone. Mm-hmm. Right. When I got to California, it took me nine months to close my first deal. Right. Mm-hmm. And that can be stressful for a lot of people. 
However, not everyone can sustain that if they don't have the funds to do so. Right. So you have to be prepared. If you're going to get in this business first full time, you have to be prepared. And if you're going to transition into it on a part time level, that's OK, too. But have a plan in place and be prepared to execute that plan. Definitely. Definitely. I like I like as well that you mentioned just the consistency. I think a lot of people don't have endurance, quite frankly. Correct. And after a while of hearing no or <laughs> stuff taking a long time or things getting difficult, they just give up. Yeah. And the crazy thing is like you could your next deal could be maybe a month or two away. Absolutely. But you'll never know if you just give up Absolutely. after seven months. If you gave up after nine months, you would have never known. We probably wouldn't be sitting here Correct. if you give up after nine months. You know Absolutely. what I mean? And it's been, you know, 15 or so years for you in the business. So I think yeah. it's important for people who want to get into this business, like you said, who want to be agents and all those things that like you got to have some thick skin absolutely no you're right you got to have some thick skin you got to be tough you got to be someone that really is truly committed like you got to be really committed to this because it's hard this is a tough business you know i get approached by a lot of young people oftentimes who ask me what do i what do i need to do to be successful in real estate what things can i do and i said first it's your mindset and your discipline and your commitment to yourself Cause like when you give up on something, you're really giving up on yourself mm -hmm. at the end of the day. If you say, I want to obtain something, I want to one day be someone or be, be something right. Or I want to one day have these experiences and you start the process and the minute it gets tough, you say, Oh, well, maybe I don't want it as bad. Or oh, you make all these different excuses. You're giving up on yourself. So I think it's important for people to understand it takes a tough mindset that you have to have coming into this business and you have to be committed. And then the other thing you have to understand, too, is that it takes an extreme level of patience because this is a relationship business. People do things when they're ready, not when you want them to. Meaning if you and I have a conversation and you say, hey, I'm thinking about selling my home. I don't go, hey, well, when can I list it? <laughs> I say, well, tell me more about your property and why do you want to sell it? Where are you going to go? What's your motivation? Try to get an understanding and build rapport that individual to, to truly see if if you can help them or if they're selling for the right reasons. It may be, hey, I may know information and say to you, you might want to wait a year or two years if you can, unless you absolutely need to sell. So I think having an understanding of how to communicate with people and provide value is really, really important. Definitely. And there's one thing you said, I, I don't want people to miss, you said someone could approach you saying they're thinking about selling their house mm -hmm. and you may advise them to wait a year or two. Yeah. And here's what I want people to get. Like, obviously that relationship, you know, you'll nurture it and you might get that commission in two years, but yeah. you did what was best for the client. Absolutely. And I think that's more important than just looking at the quick buck and trying to get the person yeah. to sell today. I will say this, putting your client's needs first is always the most important thing. Um, because if you operate based upon just a transaction or you operate just based upon the motivation of a commission, your business will be short lived. You won't make it in this business. Um, it is truly about making sure that you are genuinely committed to helping people get what they want. And I'm not just a real estate agent. I'm an advisor. Mm -hmm. Right. I've got 17 years in the business. I've been an investor own real estate. Right. Sold over 200 million. Yeah. There's other people that have sold way more. But. Once you have the level of experience that I have, that's valuable to the clientele that you're working with. It doesn't mean that just because you're going to have opportunity to work with someone, your focus should be just on the transaction. So the knowledge and value that I bring to the table is a commitment to making sure that my clients are going to get the best service. And they're also going to make they also know that I have their best interests at heart. Definitely. Definitely. Love it. So you were in Houston for a while and then eventually yeah. you transitioned to uh, California, Southern California market so yeah. talk to talk about that transition because i mean i can only imagine the differences that you saw once yeah. you decided to make the move permanently out yeah. here with your family yeah i'm glad you brought that up because you know when i came from texas houston texas you know my wife and i our mindset was like hey if we can make it here and we're doing great here how hard can it be in california <laughs> right i will tell you guys this is the toughest market to sell real estate in i don't care what nobody tells you anywhere else this is the place to be if you want to get after it and make a lot of money and also um, have the opportunity to build wealth and a legacy. And that was my vision. You know, in Texas, I was like, well, if I'm doing short sales there and making 3000 or say 5000 on a transaction, I come to California, I'm doing the same amount of work. I'm making double and triple. That was my mindset. But what I didn't realize is the learning curve that it was going to take different markets. Right. 
different cultures, different different mindsets of individuals behind the doors of the homes and the neighborhoods I wanted to sell in. So I had to figure out how to provide value and also stand out. And when I got here, like I said, it took me nine months, but I was fortunate because I had a relationship with Bank of America that it led me uh, to obviously be in a position where they offered me an opportunity to represent a lot of their clients who were in distress through a cooperative short sale program that they were offering back. So that really helped like provide the immediate income because when you're out here trying to figure it out and get it on your own, it is really challenging. So it took me about nine months to really get a, a grasp on the market here and understand how to get business and where to go for business and what things I needed to be doing to be successful. But it was definitely a big learning curve. And, you know, emotionally, you know, it was tough. It, I had a lot of stress, you know, at that time we were having our third child and we had obviously our two older daughters and uh, I was the primary breadwinner. And so when you start seeing the bank account do this, mm-hmm. <laughs> right, and the deals aren't doing this, you have to make a decision. Are you going to stay committed? Or are you going to look to go run and do something else? Well, my wife and I had a conversation. We said, we're going to double down and we're going to stay committed. And then they begin to do this, meaning the money yeah, and the deals. So I, what I learned from all of that was that nothing's easy. And if you want it, you got to go get it. Definitely. So talk about that breakthrough when mm-hmm. you landed that first deal and, and started to gain that momentum. Yeah. So my first deal that I sold was actually a condo. Um, it was like under at that time, it was probably under one hundred and fifty thousand. I can't remember the exact number, but I was like, yes, you know, I <laughs> closed the deal. But they actually came in bunches. I didn't just mm-hmm. close one. I closed like four or five in a like in a row uh, because I had been beating on doors, calling people, being consistent. But to to see the results, it, it really confirmed my inner drive and my inner intuition, the reason to come here. I was directly I, w- I was correct about that. And then to have that breakthrough, it just gave me a level of confidence to know that, hell, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. Definitely. Definitely. So you, you mentioned a couple of times just like making calls, knocking on doors. What's that conversation like? Because for a lot of people, <laughs> it might be nerve wracking to, yeah. you know, cold call somebody or. Yeah just you know this is the street i'm knocking on all these doors what's that conversation like with the potential well great question but before i answer that question you know for me thankfully i had a lot of experience dealing with people in the car business and selling Mm -hmm. luxury cars where i was comfortable with having conversation with strangers and that's hard for a lot of people to have Mm -hmm. conversation with strangers but then go to the next next level which you're knocking on someone's door right and not only are you knocking on someone's door, they may or not may they may or may not even want you. More than likely, they don't even want you at their front door, right? And then you're going to talk to them about something personal, their finances, being in foreclosure. You gotta you gotta have some guts and you gotta have some stamina and some nerves to be able to approach someone in that manner. But for me, my mindset is you don't know that I'm here to help you and that level of value that I can provide to you. And what I focused on was the individuals that wanted help, not the individuals that were upset or didn't want me at their door or didn't want me calling. I was always professional and I never had one bad experience with anyone. However, there were some people that were kind of like, I'm not interested, Mm -hmm. but I never had one bad experience because my energy, my attitude and my approach, when I knocked on the door, I said, Hey, you know, I'm aware of your situation. I'm here to help. If you aren't interested in having a conversation about it, I totally respect. And I left it up to them. And they would say, OK, well, what is it that you have? What is it you want to share with me? And I would go right into the value I had to share, how I could help them avoid foreclosure or restructure a loan for a modification. Um, I referenced my past experiences in this space and said, if you'd like to have a conversation further about it, we can. And um, that worked for me. Honestly, it worked for me and tremendously. And I would say a lot of that just goes back to you know having experiences being in front of multiple strangers day in and day out and and really being forced to have those conversations because if you're not talking to people you ain't closing no deals Mm -hmm. and that was my approach you got to be talking to people to close deals you got to be building relationships to close deals and you know taking action and being consistent with that especially when you have a family and you have people that you have to support you got to go get it you know you can't make excuses you got to say all right i might have this wall in front of me but how am i going to climb over it how am i going to go around it to break through it right Mm mm-hmm that just has to be your mindset. And that was my mindset. And I'm, I'm grateful the way that I was raised helped me to, to, to succeed in this space that I'm in today. Definitely. And, and, and in those situations that I was in when approaching homeowners, you know, out of the blue, basically. Definitely. Definitely. Some, what I'm thinking about is just the value of having sales skills. It's mm-hmm. funny. Like I, I, sometimes I talk to my wife, I'm like, you know, 
I really wish I took a career in sales coming out of school. Yeah. But I feel like in the black community, a lot of times, you know, you're, we're, we're thinking about security. We're thinking yeah. about, you know, let me get that sixty sixty five thousand dollar job out of school. I'm gonna get paid every week. Yeah. But I'm just seeing the value of having sales skills. I mean, I think it can help in a multitude of ways. So what's what's your opinion on that? Because you, you worked in sales for, for well, some time prior to, prior to real estate. Yeah, to me, man, sales is about asking the right questions. You're never gonna force someone or per persuade someone to do something they're not ready to do. You have to ask the right questions to get understanding on where those individuals are, what their needs are, what their expectations are, and how you can help them. And then advise and guide them through that process to get what they want. That's literally what sales is about. Mm -hmm. And genuinely being kind and respectful to people. And I was in an environment where I got to see sales at a very high place at a high level. And I got to see bad sales techniques and I got to see good sales techniques. And what I did is I studied the, eight, the, the actual advisors that had good sales techniques. I listened to the things that they shared. And what I just shared with you, one particular salesman who was very successful at a dealership I was working at, he told me, never lie to a customer. Tell them the truth. Help them get what they want. Listen to what they say you know, or what they're telling you that's important to them. And then at that point, go and service the need. And I took that that you know that information and just started to apply it to what i was doing in real life and it was natural for me because yeah. i genuinely want to help people so the sales process man is really about asking the right questions and then helping those individuals get what they want definitely definitely so uh, at a certain point you shifted to the luxury yeah. the higher end uh, real estate when when was that shift and what what inspired you to want to take that step yeah well the shift you know I would say it kind of took place around 2012. Um, I closed a deal with that I double ended in La Jolla, California. So if you're not familiar with all La Jolla, California, look it up. It's one of the most wealthiest zip codes in San Diego, California. Uh, I closed the deal around 1.3 million. I double ended it and I made like 80, 87 or $85,000. And that was the most money I'd ever seen in my bank account. <laughs> um, and that changed my perspective on business. It changed my perspective on well, if you can close this deal right in this community where people don't look like you, people don't um, oftentimes even engage with someone that looks like me to represent them to sell their home. I was like, how do you do this repeatedly? Right. How do you figure out how to close these transactions? So what I did is I focused on getting knowledge and experience and education. And I took a designation called Certified Luxury Home Marketing Specialist. And that designation helped me understand how to communicate with luxury or affluent buyers and sellers, what I needed to do to position myself in the market, how to prepare my mindset to engage with these individuals. And fortunately, coming from a background of selling luxury cars, I was prepared and I had the experience of dealing with an affluent buyer mm -hmm. and even a seller because someone brings their car and trade it in. You got to go back and forth with them on value, et cetera. So. I had that experience and knowledge. And then what really tipped it for me is I started looking at the amount of wealth that is in real estate, primarily in your high end sales. You know, if you sell a five hundred five, let's say you sell a five million dollar house, that's about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. You know that that type of money can change lives. And so at that point, again, going back to my analogy with with short sales when I was selling in Texas, you know, making three to five thousand versus three times the money. I'm like, well, if I'm selling the traditional home here in California for say 700,000, which in Texas, I, I compare, that's a lot of money to versus a 10 million or 3 million and 5 million, man, that's a big difference. I'm mm -hmm. still doing the same amount of work, sometimes even less work on the higher end side because there's less hand holding. So it was an immediate, um, for me changing how I was thinking to say, now you have to prepare yourself. So I took the designation and I also transferred from Remax to Pacific Sotheby's, which was a very highly successful luxury firm in San Diego, California. And that's really where I got my experience and my knowledge. You know, they offered various types of classes that I could educate myself in architecture, wow. because if you're in San, if you're here in California, period, you see all of the homes have different architecture, whereas back home in Texas, it's just pretty much, you know, ranch style homes, brick, et cetera. Pretty much they all look the same. Whereas here, every home has its own personality and no two homes are alike. So I put myself in an environment which was one of the probably top brokerages at the time with the top 
brokers that are selling high end real estate. And I studied those men and women. I watched their every moves from their marketing to how they communicated with their clients. Um, and some of them I met with and picked their brains. It was like going to college, right? Yeah. It was like going to go get my master's, which I have, but it was like, now I'm going to get my doctorates, right? And so that was my experience. And from that from that point, once I got that experience, I just got out and practiced. I went out and did what I needed to do to acquire clients from taking the information that I was learning from being in those environments. And then it led to me being to where I am today. Definitely, definitely. When you said, um, I think you said you double ended it. What does that? What does that mean? That means I closed both sides of the transaction. I represented the buyer and the seller. Got you, got yeah. you. And then from a little bit, a little while ago, what's a short sale for those who may not know what it is? So a short sale is a situation when a homeowner is basically in default, meaning they can no longer pay their mortgage and they're behind. And the bank is basically giving them an option to say, "Hey, you know, you can either." Short sale, which means you can sell the property for less than what it's owned and will forgive you for the, the remaining balance or the difference that's owed and allow you to walk away from it. Now, the downside is there is a blemish that goes on your credit, mm. but it's not like a foreclosure, but it, deal, it still does impact your credit in an adverse way. Um, however, it allows the individual to be no longer burdened mm -hmm. by that distressed asset that's upside down. So typically in the short sale, the home has zero equity. You cannot sell it without coming to the table and writing a check, whether that check is for $5 or for 5,000 or 500,000. Yeah. Most property owners in those situations do not have the funds to be able to come to the table and write a check. So therefore you're asking the bank to let you out of this situation. And what yeah. most people don't know at the time in your mortgage clause, it allows you workout options loan modifications, short sales, and deed of lieu of foreclosure. Those are your primary three options that you're going to find in your mortgage clauses that allows you a way out, if you will. Yep. And so I stated that early on when short sales first came about, nobody wanted to touch them. Nobody was interested and agents were getting out of the business. I was like, this is my opportunity to thrive and get into the business. So in essence, that's what a short sale is. Got you, got you. So one of the things you mentioned too is like you started to study and, and notice the differences between, you know, a client from our, uh, average price property and then once you get to the luxury end, what are some of those differences that you observed early on in, in the clients and like what their needs are and stuff like that? Well, you know, your more affluent clients are going to be a little bit more knowledgeable. They've owned properties before. Most of them are savvy. Um, it's not their first rodeo. Uh, they know how to interview and identify agents to that they're going to work with or they already have trusted advisors in their circle. And it's you're going to have a harder time getting to those people versus first time home buyers or someone that's a first time buyer that's ready to sell, they're not as informed about the process. They may need a little more handholding. And that's, that's not a negative thing. Like our job as advisors is to educate our clients, regardless of how, you know, whether income status is or whether they're a first time home buyer or a high end client. I have high end clients that still ask me questions because they don't know and that they seek out my professional advice. So what I've found both sides need to be advised. It's just a different level of of how can I put it care, right? And mm -hmm. advising that you provide to, you know, a more affluent buyer or seller than a less affluent buyer or seller. It's just really informing them. Um, the other thing too is, is you may have to have a certain level of patience when you're working with people that are first time buyers or first time sellers, right? Mm -hmm. And those deals may take a little bit more time to put together or earn those individuals trust, be patient with them, provide the value, communicate, be clear what your intentions are, make sure you're meeting their expectations and you're doing the things that you say that you're going to do. And when you're dealing with a more affluent buyer, you really got to be our seller. You really got to be on your A game because mm -hmm. that's the expectations. They want to work with professionals. When you go to that upper level, which is that high end luxury, it's all about your competencies. Are you competent? Can you be trusted? Are you going to do the things you say you're going to do? You have to have a successful track record or be connected to, to someone who has a successful track record for those individuals to trust you and be willing because they have a lot more to lose. They're dealing with larger assets. You know, there's more money involved in the transaction. So any errors that take place that you are responsible for can bring a lot of, you know, headache and unfortunate situations, you know, in your life if you're not experienced. But my experience is that the affluent buyer and seller isn't going to take the time to oftentimes even give someone with no experience an opportunity unless they're in close proximity to them, meaning uncle, cousin, wife, you know what I'm saying? Brother, yeah. sister, nephew. In those situations, those people kind of, you know, it's it's in the family and those individuals may give them yeah. an opportunity. But that's the difference that I've noticed since being in the business. 
Got you, got you. One, one of the things you mentioned, I think, is, is really interesting is you mentioned it, it could be difficult to build that relationship or or, or break into their circle. Mm -hmm. And I know now, like, you work with a lot of athletes. Mm -hmm. So how did you, like, when you got to that first athlete who you, who you helped through the process, like, how did you even get there? Like, how did you build the necessary relationships to yeah. to get that first transaction with an athlete? Yeah. Well, the first athlete that I worked with would have happened to be a friend of mine. So okay. it made it a little bit more, you know, how, how can I put it, like maybe easier if yeah. than, than if I was trying to connect with a stranger, which was a lot tougher. And so the way it happened was he was in a situation where he was going through a divorce. Mm. I had known him for years from playing college basketball, mm -hmm. playing overseas, and we built a really good relationship. So he trusted me. And he came to me and he was like, hey, I'm having a tough time. I'm going to need to make a decision to try and decide whether I'm going to sell these properties that I owned mm -hmm. or I'm going to keep them and get something else. Yeah. And so um, we talked about it and I advised him on what made sense. And he decided that he wanted to sell the property. And so my wife and I listed his property. And then we also represented him to purchase other properties. And so really it was a trust factor that had already mm -hmm. been there. He knew me. He knew what I stood for. He knew what type of person I was. And so that opened the door. And so once you service that first professional athlete client, that pretty much solidifies your credibility. And then from there, what I did is focus on branding myself and and, and making the right connections and building the right relationships from that point going forward mm -hmm. and and just being consistent and providing value. And when I am in communication with athletes, oftentimes I'm being asked various questions and I'm honest with them. Um, I come from a place of just being genuine and I tell them, look, whether we do business from a transactional standpoint, doesn't matter if I can be a resource to you. That's what I'm here for. If I can help you with something, it doesn't mean if I don't get paid, it doesn't. I don't care. You know, I've done plenty of things for my athlete clients that I didn't get paid on, nor was I expecting to, it was strictly to help them. And when you do that, it comes back to you tenfold. Mm -hmm. And I live by that. So by living that way and carrying myself in the manner that I do, it is, it has just created an immense opportunities for myself to, to be trusted by these individuals and for them to seek me out. Definitely. Definitely. And um, one thing I know you mentioned, like you, you're an advisor as mm -hmm. well. And, we we know the statistics, right? A lot of time, a lot of athletes, the careers are short. NFL, yeah. your career is relatively short. NBA, your career is relatively short on average. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys go broke. We've seen the you know, uh, thirty for thirty. We've we've seen all that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, what are some things that you notice in some of the clients uh, you've serviced um, or or people you've 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 known who maybe are not making the best decisions with who they're putting on their team, and and yeah. how can that change? Well, I think you just you just said it's about who you're selecting to be on your team, right? Mm -hmm. And if you if you take it from a sports perspective, I played college basketball, mm -hmm. I played professionally, and just any sport, right? If you don't put together the right team, you're not going to win, right? And real life in business, that team is your advisors, right? Those people that are going to tell you the truth, tell you what you don't want to hear, but what you need to hear. Um, those people that are going to be there to support you and have your back. And what I've seen with the individuals – let me put it this way. If you don't know, you don't know. If you don't know how to put together a right team, if you don't have anyone giving you that information or giving you the insight or mentor you and guiding you, these are 19, 20, 22, 23 year old kids, man. I mean, they don't know in the communities that a lot of these kids come from. Unfortunately, financial literacy isn't readily available. Um, these individuals don't have access to the individuals oftentimes to properly advise them and guide them. And what ends up happening, they're left open for the wolves. Right. And for the sharks. And if you don't know how to identify that wolf or that shark or what that wolf or, or shark's intentions are, if you don't have people around you to help guard, guard you from that or buffer you from that, then oftentimes they're left to have those bad experiences and then have to learn from that. So what I would say is, is that for any young professional in professional sports, build you a solid team around you. Mm -hmm. You know, don't allow your financial manager to tell you what you should be doing in real estate if they don't have experience in real estate. Now they can advise you around the numbers and you know telling you what your budget is, et cetera, and what you can afford, but get a real estate advisor that has experience and knowledge, right? Not someone they're just handing off to you to say, hey, this person's gonna help you buy this home, right? Yeah. You wanna work with someone that you know understands who you are, your culture, right? What your needs are and how to service them in a way that you're gonna be happy and satisfied with. And also you wanna be able to work with people that are going to provide the right type of information 
and educate you because any property you buy, whether it's your primary residence or it's an investment property, mm-hmm. it is an investment. <laughs> and if you make the wrong decisions, buying the wrong property in the wrong neighborhood or the wrong area or paying too much for a property, and this goes for anyone, not just athletes, then you're stuck with that problem. Mm-hmm. And so what I say to every athlete, whether you're a rookie or whether you're three to four or five years into your career, you should have a solid team around you, right? That is able to advise you. You have your financial advisors, you have your real estate advisors, you have your private equity advisors. You follow me? You should have advisors that you trust Mm -hmm. or that has shown you that they're credible and you're building trust with them. And I think when you take that approach, it can help you establish a foundation for success. And you have to also be informed. You have to want to learn the information. You can't just be like, oh, I'm going to let you handle that. That's why a lot of athletes got robbed. Yeah. Oh, just sign this right here. Okay, cool. You're trusting these individuals, Mm -hmm. right? And it could be family too, right? So number one, I will back up and say this, hire a really good attorney. Hire an attorney that you sought out, not someone that your agent brought you or that your financial manager brought you. Hire someone that you and your family have taken the time to vet, to vet, to to protect your best interest, to look over contracts, right? To look over investment opportunities that come to you. That's your buffer. Hire a really good attorney. And then from there, build your team out around that. Love it. Love it. So the athletes you work with, have they ever asked for your input on their team and who they have around them? In addition? I have. Mm-hmm. I've have, I have had a couple. I won't disclose their names, yeah. but yes, I've had, I have had a couple and I've pointed them in the right direction and said, hey, here's who you need to talk to. Here's who can actually help you with that. And whether that's solving this problem or help you get what you need. And it's a good feeling to be able to help them when they do call on you. And that's something that I think I pride myself on because that's the value. That's the brand. They know that when they call Rod Watson, they're going to get service. They're going to get someone that's going to be honest with them and someone that nine times out of 10 that can help them get what they want. That's the brand right there. Yep. You know, I think I think it's it's important. I think that's that's, that's that that'll set you apart. Absolutely. You know, because obviously, you know, you can fulfill all their real estate needs, but you can also, you know, help them holistically, right? And and I'm sure the result of that is more trust absolutely. and and hopefully a relationship that could last for for decades to come. Yep, absolutely. You know, I never try to tell my athlete clients what to do. I always try to say, "Hey, here, hey, you know, listen, this is what I think would, you know, be the best way to go or here's the best way to handle these situations or here's what you need to do give them the information and let them make that and let them make that informed decision based upon the information that they've received and what i found is a lot of the younger players not a knock against the older guys because unfortunately a lot of older guys are kept in the dark you know now information is readily available it's everywhere you can't hide stuff anymore Mm -hmm. these financial advisors for those of you that have been robbing athletes for over 20 years 30 years your time is up it's coming to an end. So with that being said, these players, they are serious about their business. They're serious about their money. And and, and, and the game is changing. Definitely. Definitely. So for uh, most of your clients, are there transactions for uh, primary residences? Are they for investments? Is it combination? It's all sorts. Yeah, all it's sorts. all sorts. Well, one of the things about living here in Los Angeles is that, you know, this is like this is business play right yep. <laughs> entertainment this is the mecca for just guys want to come out and kick their feet up have fun but also your top athletes train here every summer yep. so a lot of athletes and entertainers come here for recreation and business at the same time and it's a great place we have great weather unlike right now with may gray but typically <laughs> the weather is really amazing here in southern california yeah. So we, we see athletes who buy investment properties, um, athletes who buy primary residence or, you know, when we say investment properties, it could be a second home. Right. Um, and of course, you know, various other forms of transactions in the commercial space that mm-hmm. we've done, um, multifamily, you know, deals that we've done, which are investments. So, yeah, we, we, we've seen it all. Definitely. Definitely. So uh, one thing we talked about a little bit offline, but want to bring to the show is I saw a stat somewhere that 6% of real estate agents and brokers are black. And Mm -hmm. one of the things you mentioned was that might actually be lower. Mm -hmm. Uh, So why do you think that stat exists? Why do you think it's so low and and how can we change that? Well, because, you know, real estate is 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 a career field that has been foreign to our culture, primarily because we've been kept out of it. From redlining to discriminatory practice and lending, um, to the fact that this has been a controlled environment and space where we've been kept out of it i mean here in california over 60 years ago a black person couldn't have a real estate license now think about that and let that sink in Mm -hmm. now compare that to a race if i give you 
a quarter of a mile head start, it's going to be pretty hard to catch you and beat you. Right. Well, that's what we've been faced with as minorities, where we've been kind of forced to look at other career opportunities. Right. In entertainment. Right. In your in your traditional job sectors and real estate has never really been looked at as that's for us. And, you know, my mission and a part of my motivation and even stepping into this space is to bring inspiration. Right. And to change that standard and and show that representation does matter and that people that look like you and I can succeed and operate in this space. And so I felt that this is when I came to California, it was a perfect opportunity to be that person that brings the inspiration, that breaks the mold, that shows others that you can have success at this level. Right. And you can sell high end homes. And so I think it's really about seeing people people seeing people that look like them doing and that's why i go back to saying representation matters it is important and i think that number is going to go up and the more people who make real estate look cool and makes real estate the new flex versus running to go buy a rolls royce truck or you know or a big chain to wear around your neck for 300 or half a million dollars go invest that money in real estate Mm -hmm. you know and build Definitely, definitely. And uh, something else I, I want to talk to you about uh, your experiences. So we talked about some challenges you've had. Have you had negative experiences at different brokerages you've worked at in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, I've had negative experiences. But what I also learned is that those those environments weren't built for us to succeed in. And that's OK. You know, you can't just walk in someone's house and tell them how to run their house and you know, tell them what you what what you think should be done. They built it for themselves. They built it to run the way they want it to run. So they're not necessarily obligated. These are private companies. These aren't publicly held companies. They're not held to the standard of a Google or Amazon where these public companies have, you know, HR and certain standards that they have to adhere to. And these private brokerages, they can treat you like crap. And as an independent 1099 contractor, there's nothing you can do. Right. So my example of that is that I was at a major brokerage and um, here in Los Angeles and um, I was there for about maybe seven or eight months, maybe nine months, give or take. And one day I got a phone call out of the blue. Now, keep in mind, I never bothered anyone. I actually showed up to the office before most people got in. I'm in the office at 6 a.m. I'm leaving the office at 10 a.m. to go hit the field to go have my regular meetings and do what I do. Not one negative experience with anyone in the company. So I get a phone call one morning from the office manager saying, hey, unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the company like seven o'clock in the morning. Now, now, mind you, I just saw him three days prior in the office where my wife was there with me and even my youngest daughter. She was younger. Right. Mm-hmm. And I go in the office, close my door. I saw him say, hey, what's up? Not a problem. Three days later, you're asking me to leave the company. And I say, well, what's this about? I'm confused. Well, I'm not I'm not at liberty to tell you why. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. You, you're going to tell me why you're asking me to leave, but you're not giving me a reason. Who does that and what? He says, well, you don't fit our company culture. I said, whoa. I said, well, what does that mean? Code, I know what it meant, right? And he didn't, he he just was like, I can't say anymore. So I got off the phone with him and I contacted the CEO of the company. His response to me is, oh, I'm sorry we're at this place. I'm going to have to ask you to speak to our general counsel. So I'm like, what is, I'm like, man, what's going on? Like, I'm, I'm going to, man, I'm a man. Just tell me. I'm like, if there's something happening that I'm not aware of, well, if something took place that as far as I know, I haven't did anything to anyone. So they responded back to me saying, well, we had an, uh, an internal investigation on you that there was improper behavior towards staff members. So I'm thinking like, I'm blown away. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I don't talk to anyone. The people that I do talk to it. I, I'm in good standing with them as far as I know. So I reach out to all the people that I often talk to in the office. Hey, is something happened with them? No. What are you talking about? Right. So then I'm like, OK, this is really weird. So I press it a little bit further, call my attorney. Obviously, I'm a 1099 contractor. They can tell me we can let you go at any time mm-hmm. for no reason. I understood that. But the way that they were handled, it was like you're trying to assassinate my character and my name and say that I've done something to people. Well, who are these people? Well, we're not at liberty to tell you who they are. I said, so someone can come say I did something to them, but I don't get to defend myself. W- what world does that happen? It doesn't happen to a white person as far as I've, I I can say from my own experiences deep down in my gut. It's not happening because I was informed by someone who worked there. They had someone on, that was an agent who had sexual harassment, you know, allegations against them. That person was still working at the company. Mm-hmm. So I, I immediately just pulled back and said, you know what? It's cool. This ain't the place for me to be. 
<laughs> if, if you guys are going to try to make up some farce story and try to assassinate my character just because for whatever reason, someone else doesn't want me here. And that's really what I felt it came down to is that other agents, for whatever reasons, whether they're threatened, I don't know. I never got the the, the truth. There was nothing I could do about that. Mm-hmm. And that showed me right then and there, you don't need to be in these places. These places are not built for you to succeed. Now, mm-hmm. there may be some people that look like you that can come here and have sex, but for you and for where you're headed, this ain't it. So what I did at that point is I pulled back, I went independent, and I never looked back. And that's why I'm sitting where I am today, because I believed in myself. And I'd already came in with success before I got there. In my mm-hmm. mind, I was like, this could help elevate me. But what I realized is that I just need to give myself a little bit more time, keep my head down, mm-hmm. keep working, keep building relationships. And the minute I left there, my freaking business blew through the roof. Right. Yeah. I ended up servicing and doing nine deals with athletes the, the, the year that I left there. Wow. Right. And so moral of the story is, man, you're going to have ups and downs in this business. There are going to be people in this business that don't like you. There are a lot of like haters in this business. Trust me, you're going to deal with them. But. That's pretty much anything. If you're having yeah. success or people see that, you know, you're moving a certain type of way and they're envious of it, whatever. Like you just have to be prepared in this business. You're going to face those types of experiences. But what I've also learned is that when you create something for yourself and you can stand on that and you can provide value and hold your head up high and be confident in what you're doing, that's the best feeling in the world. And yeah. that's success. And I had that prior to coming in there. So I had to remind myself who the hell I was yep. to get back up on my feet and keep working. Definitely, definitely. So did you end up starting your own I did. Uh, company after that? I did, yeah. How long ago was that, roughly? It was over four years ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So talk, talk to us more about um, just starting your own company, uh, what it's, how it's presently structured and, and all those things. I think that that turning point, man, a lot of people, it would have pushed them out oh, of business. Oh, it would have pushed them out of business. Completely. Completely. It was devastating just to even be treated that way. Yeah. Yeah, but I knew what I had. Here's the thing. The, the, my life experiences, we don't have to get into them, but I've been through some stuff, right? And a lot of people have. And yeah. I just looked at it as, you know what? You built for this. And that's why you went through all the things you went through in life because this is a part of your journey. And you're built for it. You just got to put, you know, you got to just got to keep moving forward, you know? and. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to get knocked down. Sometimes people are going to try to block you or stop you. But at the end of the day, I realize just pivot and keep moving. Definitely. 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 So, yeah. Talk to us more more about the company. And, and yeah. I'm sorry about it. So, no, the you're company, good. You're good. so the company, man, you know, my wife and I, we found it. Um, our focus at that point after I had those experiences I just shared was that I wanted to create a company where people that look like us can come and work freely without being discriminated against. Um, without any interruption in what they're doing in their careers, they can get real support, um, given real equitable opportunities, be put in a position to succeed. Kind of like if if you were my artist, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to put the time and energy into helping you be the best agent that you can possibly be, that I know you're not going to get this level of attention and service anywhere else because I've been in all these other major companies and I know exactly what it's like to be behind those walls. So I created a company where agents that look like you and I, and, and we welcome anyone. We got agents that are white, we got agents that are Latino, but we're a diverse company, right? As a luxury firm. And what our focus was that we train these agents how to go out and be the best top producing professionals in the industry. And with that, I can go to sleep at night feeling like I'm doing my part to help open the doors, create equitable opportunities as I shared, and for other agents that look like us to be able to walk into this space and truly have success. Because there's nothing more defeating and intimidating when you walk in these white firms and people look past you, they look through you, they look over you, or they do things to try and stop your progress. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can sustain that and keep going, right? And I felt like that's a huge unfair injustice Mm -hmm. and i'm not gonna sit back and watch that happen and not do anything about it so i felt doing my part was creating my own firm and and a part of that came from you know the experiences of course that i had but my belief in myself allowed me to continue to move forward because i also said this isn't just about you what you're doing is going to create opportunities for the next generation to be able to walk through these doors and get the experience and the knowledge to succeed That's it. That's my purpose. And so we created Distinct Concierge Real Estate, um, which I'm passionate about and I love. We service everyone. But our niche market is sports and entertainment. I'm passionate about that, as you know. 
However, what I'm more passionate about is seeing agents of color thrive without the disruption, without the without the discriminatory actions and practices that a lot of these firms will use or are telling you that this is your place. You should stay here. They don't have to deal with that when you come and you work at Distinct Concierge. We're based in Beverly Hills. We're also based in San Diego. We have seven agents on our roster and growing, but we're we're operating more like a private family office. My approach is like we're not for everyone. We're for a distinct level of clientele who wants an elite level of service and who wants to be treated fairly and who also wants to have a great experience. That's our philosophy. Love it, love it. And and what what we've what I've experienced this whole interview is just your tenacity. Like I can I can feel it, you know. Yeah. Just bouncing back from so many challenges and you know, this really should be an encouragement to people like you will go through difficulties, Absolutely. you know, on this journey, whether you want to be an agent, whether you want to be an investor, like you, it's just, you can't give up. You got to keep going until you reach that goal and, and get up again, yep. you know, get up again, try it again. Yep. And it just makes you stronger. It makes yep. you better. And I mean, look what yep. we have here today. It's really life. Like you're yep. going to have ups and downs in life. You know, people think that everything's supposed to be peachy creamy all the time and every day and that's just not reality and what i learned man i brought the tenacity that i that i had in sports and basketball to real estate and um that's helped me thrive you know i'm i'm a stubborn i remember my coach used to say you're stubborn as hell you know and i'm like well that's a gift and it'll pay off for me at some point in time and i didn't ever looked at it as a negative and i looked yeah. at it as something as a strength that i once I learned how to effectively use it and use that tenacity, that stubbornness and that will not to get I'm my whole philosophy is I'm gonna get I'm gonna get it or I'm gonna die trying. Yeah. That's it. I'm gonna get it or I'm gonna die trying. One of the two is gonna happen. I'm gonna die before I get it or I'm gonna get it. But in the process, you're gonna see me working towards getting it. Definitely. Repeatedly, day in and day out. And that's my mantra and that's my motto and I live by that. And I'm consistent as hell. Go check my resume. Definitely, definitely. What uh, what uh, position did you play? Point guard. You, you, I could tell. That's why. That's why. <laughs> that's why. You know, for me, winning is you know, winning is everything, man. And like, and also losing. You can learn from losing. Yeah. You know, losses are just lessons. But you know, being a point guard, my whole philosophy was: I don't care who's shooting, as long as you playing hard, you playing on both ends of the floor, and you giving it your all, and you're taking quality shots, right? And you being a team player, I don't care who's shooting the ball. I don't care how many points this person scores or that person scores. As long as we win it, I'm going to be dishing the rock and I'm going to set you up and I'm going to get it where you need to get it and make sure you do what you need to do. Definitely, definitely. And you said you, uh, you played overseas for a little bit yep, as well? Yeah, I did. Yep. Where'd you play? Sao Paulo, Brazil. Oh, what was that like? Great was that experience. It was, like? it was a short experience, but it was great. You yeah. know, you know, obviously anytime you get to like I was down in Mexico City, I had experience playing there against their national teams. Like anytime you get to just play a game or do something that you love and be paid for it. It's like what I do in real estate. I get paid to work with athletes and celebrities. Excuse me. I love that. I enjoy it. It's the same like when I was hooping. Yeah. I get paid, right, to basically go out and shoot a ball through the hoop. It was a great experience. Yeah. You know, I met a lot of great people. Um, I learned a lot about myself, you know, being away from home, being outside of the U.S. and being in an environment where it's just you, just your thoughts, your emotions. Keep in mind, Internet was new. There mm -hmm. was no social media. Um, you know, mo cell phones were still fairly new. You know, and the call, you know, those roaming charges was out through the roof. So <laughs> I had calling cards to call home. Yeah. and you know, eight TV dinners and stuff like that, you know, set in my apartment but alone by myself. But what that did for me is it prepared me mentally for the real world and what life was about. And and that you know, on your journey to per, to pers pursuit of happiness, enjoy the process, enjoy everything that you go through, the good and the bad. And I had some down moments as a player um, and I had to learn how to deal with that and get through that and be a professional at the end of the day. Because that's what you're getting paid to do mm -hmm. is to be a professional. And so it was a great experience. Definitely, definitely. So something I want to get your take on, you know, we know the statistics around, you know, how the short amount of time the black dollar spends yeah. in the black community. But I want I want your perspective on how can we circulate the black dollar within real estate? Because there's so many different <laughs> lanes of real estate. Yep. Um, so what's your take on that? Man, we bro brother, we have to be intentional. We have to be intentional as hell. We have to be intentional, just like every other race and culture is intentional about working with their own. 
When you look at it statistically, Asians work with Asians, Jews work with Jews, Latinos mm-hmm. work with Latinos. You know, I can go on down the list. And it doesn't mean you don't see oftentimes where a Jew might, Jewish person might be working with a black person or a Latino person might be working with an Asian person, but it's rare, right? And that's for a reason. Those people understand what you just shared, how to keep that dollar circulating amongst their communities. It isn't personal, it's business. It's vital to their livelihoods and their culture. We just haven't been taught that yet. We haven't under fully understand the value because all of the crap we've had to go through. Right. And so now, like I said, we're at a point in time where the information is readily available. And I'm saying this and I've said it before. We have to be intentional with working with our own. I don't care if you are first time home buyer or if you that high paid NBA athlete, especially for those individuals that have uh, authority, those mm-hmm. individuals that have the ability to change the impact and the direction of the narrative that we've had to you know, experience. Be intentional. Seek out professionals that look like you in this space for representation. And if we do that, we'll start to see those dollars circulate amongst ourselves. And I think that's already starting to happen. When you look at Atlanta, you look at Charlotte, you mm-hmm. look at Houston in the real estate space, you look at D.C., right? Alabama, I can, I'm naming quite a few markets, right, where there's a lot of diversity, a lot of African-American people that are thriving in the real estate space right now. So it is happening, but we want to see it happen also at a larger scale. Mm-hmm. Like Jay-Z just bought a $200 million house. Now, I don't know who the agents were just yet disclosed, but I know the area because I've sold out in Malibu, too. I sold probably one of the largest transactions, not in dollar, but in land, wow. 225 acres to Sheesh. a professional athlete in Malibu, which that land, if he does everything that we've discussed and talked about that can be done from a development standpoint and building homes on it, 100 mil, 150 mil. OK, so. Jay-Z bought and Beyonce bought a $200 million property. But the question is, was there black representation on that transaction? And if not, why? I mean, Jay-Z is a billionaire. He ain't got answer to me. Beyonce ain't got answer to me. But from my understanding and what I observed with Jay-Z talking about us unifying, right? Talking about black excellence. I think it would be major move to see if there was a black agent on that transaction involved why because that tips the pendulum the opposite direction where more people see that more athletes see that and they go all right i want to get behind that i i i I see him making those moves so i think it's about awareness and us being intentional i know i gave the long version i'm passionate about this but (laughs) honestly bro we got to be intentional about our actions and how we handle our business we got to care less about what everybody else is doing what everybody else is wearing what everybody else is driving and be really in tune with how we're doing our business and how we're conducting ourselves I agree 100%. It's and, a race, and that's mm-hmm. why they call it racism. It is a freaking race, and right now we're behind. 100%. And we know why, but we can change that. And we can change that in a short period of time, regardless of what the statistics say and what people are saying. We really control the powers when it comes down to economics. Everybody's making money off us. And I ain't talking about no little money. I'm talking about trillions of dollars off of our culture, who we are as black people, African-Americans or indigenous individuals. However you identify, we are the juice. And until we start squeezing the juice in our own jar, everybody else is going to keep taking and sipping it. And we're going to be left with nothing. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't couldn't have said it, said it better myself. Something else I want your opinion on is on the representation side. I agree it's incredibly important, but for some reason, like some black people don't trust other black people who are competent Mm -hmm. in their field of expert. Why is that? That means they internally got something going on with themselves. They've been conditioned to believe for whatever reason that maybe white is right, or they don't, they don't see or have the value in within valuing people that look like them can be competent and provide that information. And sometimes maybe it's a flex. They feel like if they're working with the other side, you know what I'm saying? They've arrived. So, I don't judge those individuals and I honestly can't speak to what's in their hearts. But I think that if any individual has a problem in working with someone that looks like them, someone that um, identifies with them and who they are from a cultural standpoint and they choose not to work with them and work with someone else outside of their culture intentionally because it's a decision. You know, and and again, it may be relationships there and there's nothing wrong with that. If there's relationships there with the other side and you Mm -hmm. got that trust. By all means, handle your business if they're not black. But if it isn't and you have someone sitting in front of you that is and you overlook them to go work with someone else that is outside of your culture, 
then, you know, it's an unfortunate situation. And I think what we have to do is focus on the people that are willing mm -hmm. to give those opportunities and how do we support them? How do we support their voices? How do we get it out that this is happening more often and regularly, right? Because look, they put million dollar listens in your face all day, right? That is showing representation at the highest freaking level. Mm -hmm. It's not just entertainment. They're showing you we're representing 99% of the people buying these homes look like the agents that are on that TV screen, right? And they're intentional about working with each other on their own. If you don't believe it, bring your behind out here to Southern California as a minority and, and, and try to operate in this space. And you'll find that it is really, really difficult and you don't know the right people. So I think to answer that question, you asked me about that individual. I think we really have to look past those people. Like, <laughs> and we got to focus on the ones that really want to give people that look like them those opportunities and do business with them because you can't change that individual's mindset. There's nothing you can say or do to change that individual's mindset, nor can you judge them for whatever their life experiences is and how they perceive themselves and value themselves and value that connection with another mm -hmm. brother or sister and value seeing that money circulate amongst another brother and sister. If they don't see the value in that, it's something going on internally. Definitely, definitely. And so, something else I want to ask you is, so if someone is, I, I just got my real estate license mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm looking for like the right brokerage considering the experiences if you you've had how can someone properly vet that company to to ensure that that's a good place for them to start yeah well if you're a minority one you want to look at companies that are that have a track record of helping the minority succeed in real estate first and foremost and steady those individuals interview them don't just go in thinking you're they're interviewing you interview them you know, um, talk to the agents that look like you that work in that company and ask them what their experiences are with the leadership within that company or that brokerage. Right. And I think starting in those two places, you're going to get a lot of information that's going to help you make your decision on whether that's the right place for you. And that's what I did. And um, when I did go into firms that majority of the people in those firms didn't look like me, I was already understanding and aware and prepared for what, you know, was pretty much expected, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But, you know, that, that's that's what I would say to answer that question. Definitely, definitely. And um, man, I'm just blown away. This is this has just been a really dope, dope interview. And I think yeah. it's been amazing to hear the, the progression, you know, yeah. hear the story, you know, starting off uh, in Houston yep. and then making the leap to the, the big market here in Southern California man. and just the challenges you had to persist through, the experiences you had at, some of those other brokerages yeah. starting your own company you know representing athletes and you know as somebody who who used to play ball i'm sure it's like you probably can't believe yeah where you are now considering like where you started you know what yeah. growing up was like and all that stuff so i think it's amazing yeah thanks man i mean i never could imagine working in this career field like this at this level i not even something that ever crossed my mind um, however, when I first started learning about real estate, I did believe that that was a career path that was for me and that I that I could succeed in. But I never thought I'd be working with the, the level of clients that I've had the opportunity and, and, and been blessed to, to, to work with. So I say all that to say this, you know, when you when you when you when you're first starting out and you don't know what you want to do, just be patient with yourself. But listen to your internal moral compass and and what it what it what is where it's guiding you or what is guiding you towards and i think as long as you're doing that and you're doing right by people and you're always having an open mind and you're working to learn and grow you're gonna have success now you may not necessarily get to work with celebrities and entertainers if you're in real estate because that is really a tough market to break into or get into you already kind of have to have some relationships in that space or have people willing to to make those introductions or refer but it doesn't mean you can't build up to that and Basically, that's what I did. I build up until the point to where when I closed my first deal with an athlete, I was like, you know what? This is natural for me because I am a former athlete. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people in this space. And I was having a lot of adversity working with people out here in California when it comes to primary listing homes, you know, because working with buyers, I work with all races. But when you're listing properties out here, 99 percent of the people behind the doors don't look like you and I. So I had to figure out a way to reinvent myself and to be to be able to succeed and thrive. And I found that it was a natural progression for me to be able to work with people that I already knew that looked like me. So I'm thankful and blessed that I get to do this and I don't take it for granted in any way. I don't, I wake up every day smiling and thankful that I get to do what I do. 
Definitely, definitely. And before we wrap as well, uh, let people know where they can follow you, keep up with you, keep in contact with you and all the great things that you're doing. Yep. Um, you can uh, follow me on Instagram at Rod Watson 23 on Twitter at Rod, at Rod Watson 23 and on LinkedIn, Rod Watson. Um, those are the platforms where I am primarily. Um, obviously, if you ever want to contact me, um, you can reach me um, my, on my, uh, my, inf- my number and my information is on my Instagram profile. So just reach out. Love it, love it. And thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Again, if you're on YouTube, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, share this with a friend. If you're on audio, leave us that five star rating and review. Thank you all so much. I look forward to hearing from you all soon. What's up, y'all? Sam here from the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Thank you so much for watching another episode. Definitely take a moment to subscribe. Make sure you like this video. Also, visit our website, blackrealestatedialogue.com, and follow on Instagram at Black Real Estate Dialogue. Talk to you soon.